my name is Garrett McDonald, and this is Brendan Playford. And, Hi, guys. And um, we're here to tell you about the, uh, the energy blockchain and give you an overview of that. Um, so today we just would love to take the opportunity to talk to you about a couple different things. Um, first of all, we kind of want to frame the situation of the state of energy markets today. Um, and to find the opportunity for a new energy paradigm and, um, and point out how current public blockchain infrastructure is generally incompatible um, with, uh, with the energy infrastructure today um, and how we're building a new infrastructure that will enable that transition and then give it an example of an application that will run there. Um, so energy infrastructure today was largely designed a long time ago um, and a lot of regulation that applies to it today which stifles the innovation uh, was put in place about 100 years ago and has been lobbied for to keep in place since then. Um, so there's massive inefficiencies in the entire ecosystem and infrastructure and um, the control and distribution of energy today is actually quite antiquated. And so um, there's a lot of regulation that's preventing us from, um, from Im implementing a new system. So it's super important that we work with the current incumbents to integrate this system. Um, and um, yeah. Yeah, so I just want to quickly ask everyone in the room, how many of you here are kind of aware of how your energy, what process energy goes through to get to your home right now? Do you even know whether you're in a deregulated space or a regulated space? There are certain states in America. Hands up, really, if anyone fully understands the process through which their energy goes to get to them. So that's one guy over here, not many people here. So the, the infrastructure that we have right now is pretty, anti you know, pretty antiquated, and it's set up for a sort of centralized, highly capitalized market system whereby you generally have monolithic generators on a network that transmit power directly to a consumer. In Europe, that's changed a little bit with deregulation, and certainly in the US markets where you've got California, New England, Texas deregulated, which gives the opportunity for more competition, a little bit more exposure for other players to come into the market and offer unique products. And really, you know, there's, there's, there's limited opportunities for new players to come in. There's limited opportunity for new technology to be embraced. For example, novel gasification, we obviously have a big rush for solar and wind right now, which is being very, very well financed. Um, but also a lot of like small scale projects. Yeah, and today there's a bunch of huge inefficiencies and basically it boils down to for every 100 energy units that are generated and intended to be used by a consumer, only 10 of those actually get to the endpoint. And um, when you, do, when you uh, apply this model to something like a data center, for instance, it's closer to 1%. Um, so this is actually ridiculously low, and most of that happens because of inefficient power generation. Um, so if we can localize the power generation and provide an infrastructure that enables that and enables the value to be transferred in that new ecosystem, then we can really increase this, the actual delivered energy flow. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to add something to that really quickly as well. Um, the International Energy Association, by 2050, is planning on getting 57% of all renewables to kind of give global supply of energy. So 57% of the total energy produced will have to come from renewables. Now, an interesting point to note about that is when you look at renewables technology, a lot of it is decentralized distributed power, small scale stuff which doesn't really have any links to a network right now. So if I've got solar panels on my house, yes, that's great, I might have a grid tie, I might benefit from a feed-in tariff, but there's a whole host of other tokenized sort of derivatives that you can take from that model which can unlock a huge amount of economic abundance from already distributed systems. In order to coalesce all of these things together, we can do that really well on blockchain. So I'm going to leave Garrett to talk a bit more, and then I'll come back to those points. Yeah, so basically, to enable this new energy future, what we need to do is create a, a network where every single device that's able to consume or produce energy is connected as a node. And that node is an agent that's aware of all of the other nodes in its locality and can react dynamically according to the current market conditions, how much energy is being sold for, whether what time of day it is, whether there's an abundance of solar power that needs to be consumed to not flood the market or flood the power lines. And there's actually quite a difference between uh, interacting in physical infrastructure like this and something like finance, where here, if you mess up some numbers, then you can actually cause fires and deaths. Um, it's not just a simple rewrite. So it's, uh, it's actually very, very critical that the infrastructure is completely secure and um, that we do it very correctly. Yeah, and I'm going to add something to the end of there as well, which is when you're looking at how these bits of hardware infrastructure get financed, it's obviously in the interest of the actual utility operator, so the actual generator on the network to um, finance that 
and create a sustainable way of getting return for investors on those big capital projects. Again, going back to the fact that renewables are generally distributed systems, in order to bring about and unlock value and create more incentive for people to either crowdsource or pull together of resources or small groups of community investors into, I don't know, like a biogas or a wind project in Africa, giving a platform where people can come together to actually finance that, giving these distributed systems where at the moment you can take a renewable ed energy credit, for example, for a small solar installation on your house and participate in the rock or the rec market, which for small independent people with solar panels on their house is not something they can do. You generally go through an agent, you generally bundle these recs or rocks up into one package and send them out to auction. So we're looking at creating like a frictionless way of moving value around this system. And that's moving value, not just of energy. It's also ways in which smaller producers and smaller participants in the network can benefit from getting value from what they already have. Uh, and I think that's like that unlocking of value is really powerful here with what we're looking at. It's going to give people a much more frictionless experience uh, and able to do more with what they've got. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so here's a little demo that one of our partner companies made, uh, Grid Singularity, that um, just shows a simulation of a local energy grid where, um, all of, where each section of the network is able to dynamically react to the others. And it just shows an example of pricing and if you turn off the power plant, how the houses in that network react. Um, so you can see that when the power plant is turned off, that uh, the houses will dynamically um, adjust their consumption and production loads and, um, and basically just react to that. So that way, in the event of an actual outage in a real power plant, um, the houses will be able to still consume power locally and produce it and interact with each other. Um, and this is going to be a huge resiliency improvement for energy grids all over the world once this is implemented. Um, so, of course, the infrastructure today doesn't work very well for that, so we're building a new one. And it's called the Energy Web Blockchain. Um, and we have our testnet live right now. Um, a NetSets page is live, and we just open sourced it on the first of this month. Um, and it's, everything's accessible there. Um, we can do 2,500 transactions a second right now because it's proof of authority. Uh, the authorities are energy companies that we currently trust to keep the lights on. So we figure that it's reasonable to trust them also to validate blocks correctly. Um, and right now it's an open network, and it will always be an open network that anybody can use freely and run applications and transact value. Um, any Ethereum smart contract, of course, is completely compatible and can run on the Energy Web Foundation um, blockchain. And interchain communication is something that we're very much prioritizing, and we want to have that um, coming really soon. So, for instance, uh, projects like Polkadot will be very high on our list to implement, so that way we can um, interact with the Ethereum public blockchain as well. And I, I think I just want to reflect on a way that um, I'm involved in this mix. We're, uh, the project that we're working on right now is called the Aurora Network. And what it is, it's an open source hardware project where through these mechanisms we're building, we can actually deploy hardware that's innovative and otherwise wouldn't find funding. So I've got a really good example, biomass gasification particularly. Small scale biomass gasification classically is pretty much unheard of unless you're on a commercial scale. And when you look at the way in which, um, going back, can you just pop back a couple of slides, one more? Uh, one more? Yeah, to this, to this whole household model here, when you're looking at, for example, solar, there's a supply-demand curve of which you've got, say, this massive abundance of solar energy during the day, currently not sufficiently deployed storage batteries to take that power offline. And our usage is generally out of whack with that. Like, we're all at work during the day. The majority of like, actual power consumption isn't until the morning or the evening. You get this dull period. And we're all used to getting cheap electricity in some regions through the night. You get the economy saving between like 1 a.m. and 7 in the morning. That's because big power stations have to keep running. They don't just shut down. Shutting down costs a ton of money. So by implementing this system whereby you can take energy as and when it's needed from core parts and understand what equipment you can bring online and when. So for example, in a time of high demand, you have a bit of equipment that would otherwise cost more to run or more to cut, like produce a unit of energy, that may come on in these times of high demand, and you may have a variable pricing model for that. So that energy can be used and acquired and sort of leveled across the network, but you're effectively smooth. And this is like a smart grid effect. And a lot of these companies are kind of moving towards this more smart grid. And again, this vision of a more distributed power network. Um, this beautifully supports that. 
Um, and when you're actually looking at tokenizing, for example, the energy on the network, you need a high transaction throughput to do that. The rate and volume of which you're planning on scaling to to make this be a very impactful global sort of infrastructure that allows this transfer of value and flow of markets globally so you can take abundance in one area and maybe deploy that in an area where there may not be the infrastructure or the actual drive to develop in an African community, for example. So California is a great example. California, there is an abundance of walnut shells that are supplied by walnut manufacturing companies. So where do they go right now? Those walnut shells are dumped or burnt. There is no value being created by that byproduct. So take those walnut shells, put them through something like a gasifier on site, have a grid tie, tie that back to the network, and actually use that energy in a way where you can either sell that directly to a consumer using your tokenized model and link that with more of the smart meters we're seeing. Like there are these inductive smart meters where you clamp them onto your incoming feed of your house and it will do a Fourier transform on your frequencies of your energy and it will tell you after about a month of learning, your fridge is using 60% of the power, your toaster is using 0.1%, whatever that mix looks like. And if you analyze that data, you can actually start incentivizing good actors in the system. So I can make an assessment of what the usage in this house should be. If an actor is overusing that, they pay a fee. If an actor is underusing and coming below a threshold, they get paid that back. So you're not just incentivizing smarter energy distribution, you're incentivizing good behavior and you're incentivizing better practice on the network whereby the participants contribute overall to a lower demand, and that's done in like a fluid and organic way. Um, and because everything is so static right now, for instance, in California, sometimes there are events where in the middle of the day on a, on a hot summer day, there's a bunch of abundance of solar power that the yeah. market just doesn't need. Um, the rest of the resources are not flexible, so they're not able to ramp down production fast enough to actually utilize the solar energy. So the utility companies sometimes ask the solar producers to turn off their panels, so that way the abundance of, of electrons don't flood the network. Um, and so this is obviously a huge waste and not effective utilization of our solar industry. So um, yeah, basically enabling the, all of the resources on the network to be a lot more flexible will enable a much higher utilization of all the electricity we're generating from renewables especially, especially the ones that vary. Yeah, and I think this vision as well for the more IoT connected sort of state. So where you have these feedback mechanisms into a smart grid, where it understands exactly what to switch on and off when, uh, is really kind of that utopian vision of a really efficient marketplace where you're, again, going back to this allowing a nice flow of value. So when you unlock value in systems that isn't currently used, you know, our vision is to then use some of that elsewhere in the world to make an actual impact. So take that station that's really abundant and producing revenue and using a portion of that to develop other, you know, other infrastructure elsewhere, invest that in more kind of skunk works, new development, open source hardware, which does exist out there that currently isn't getting the attention because it's hard to monetize, hard to justify costs, and incumbents just would like to continue in the current paradigm. Yeah, yeah exactly. And um, so the ecosystem within energy applications that are seeking to use blockchain infrastructure in some magnitude is expanding super rapidly. Uh, this is a smattering of, uh, of companies that are, that are trying to accomplish this. Um, some of them we have ag agreements with already and we're working actively with. We've spoken with all of them. Um, all of them have shown interest in using the energy web blockchain for the purposes uh, simply because you can have a lot more transaction throughput and so on. Um, so, and, and some of them have gone to the point of uh, purchasing tokens in the Energy Web blockchain, um, which are used as gas, similar to ETH and Ether and Ethereum. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you very much. It's a huge honor to be here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having us. And, um, yeah, we do have a couple more minutes left, so if there are any questions, we're happy to take those. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. Did anyone have any questions? If you don't, that's fine. If you do. There's one right there. Yeah, go for it. So uh, in your presentation, there was a slide where you mentioned uh, that energy demand uh, fluctuates throughout the day. And that doesn't yeah. coincide with uh, uh, energy that's produced um, through means like solar. My question is, what role do uh, technologies like uh, in-house batteries, think Tesla, Powerwall, 
have in addressing that specific problem? Yeah, absolutely. So basically the idea is with the Tesla Powerwall is if you, and if you have an infrastructure that supports the leasing of batteries on a short time scale, like for instance over the course of a day, then if there's abundance of solar on one home, uh, for instance if we just go back to the simulation, if there's an abundance of, of power on, on this home because they have a lot of solar panels and only two batteries and this one doesn't have that, but maybe he has more storage capacity. Um, then basically you can lease out the battery and use that solar power throughout the day to power everything during the night when it's not there. So that way you're shaving the peak a lot. So batteries like that uh, play a tremendous role in actually utilizing the solar power more effectively, even though you have an obvious um, decrease in efficiency when you store electrons in a battery. You lose some, but the gains over um, just utilizing, utilizing the normal grid is tremendous. Yeah, and, and I think something I'll add to that as well is not just to be too narrow in solar, is to also look at a lot of the other technologies that are out there. So in the UK, there is a system called the Triad Network, and what the Triad Network does, it is a bunch of distributed diesel gensets, very, very big, substantial ones tied to the grid in strategic locations around the UK. Between the hours of 6 and 7 p.m., they all switch on. They switch on, they provide a very expensive kind of surcharged power which balances this load. So I think it's about thinking about how you can also bring on more novel technologies, like you can use recycled cooking oil that's been reprocessed in a diesel gen set as a biomass fuel in a strategic location. The infrastructure for that costs a little bit more, but if you are able to switch it on at the right time of demand and only use it when demand is high, then that can help balance that load. So it's a combination of storing and finding dynamic load in the network that can instinctively switch on based on the load balancing that's kind of in the smart grid to bring that power on when it's needed. So you've got this nice blend of battery, which is going to take some time to kind of get affected on the network, and novel technology is there to boost it, but focusing on renewables for that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, there was a really interesting talk yesterday that treated this as an optimization problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess I'm curious uh, what the change in efficiency is between the optimized version and the normal market, uh, if you know. Uh, sorry, in, in terms of like... Yeah, uh, yeah thanks. Yes. Uh, if you could repeat yourself, I didn't quite hear the... Between which market and... Um, there was a speaker from Berkeley the other day. Yeah. Uh, who essentially had everyone sort of bid and schedule stuff. Uh, and I guess it sounds like it's sort of a real-time auction. Uh, so yeah. I think what you're asking, are you asking between the future vision for a network like this and what we have currently, is it just an optimization exercise where value's coming from efficiency savings because we have a little bit more fluidity in the network? Is that what you're saying? Um, no, but uh, I, I take back my question, I guess. Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> Anyone else? Hey. Um, here. Well, okay. thank you for the, for the talk. I had a quick question about distribution because you talk about production and also storing at the local nodes. Sure. But isn't there an issue about distribution still being somewhat centralized and also in waterfall pattern which would prevent peer-to-peer -peer or, send en or sell energy to my neighbor kind of thing because there's no connection there? Yeah, um, right now the distribution grid is definitely centralized, and the idea is to work with them and bring more and more distribution grid owners onto this network, and then eventually we'll be able to decentralize the ownership of that. Um, of course, that's what we all want. We want a completely decentralized system, um, but enabling the current incumbents in the market to start acting with these technologies and profiting more from these is the first step to getting them on board to a really, truly decentralized system. Um, so, event yeah, you're completely right that it is still centralized in that there there's generally one monopoly in the state like most of California or a state like Colorado, mm -hmm. um, where one company often owns the entire distribution grid. Um, so yeah, we hope that'll change over time. Yeah, so, isn't there a physical limitation by the fact that you can't actually even s send energy from your home so because there's no... So it depends. I, I think what we're saying is so there's, we've got deregulated markets and regulated markets which will allow generators access on or off the network and that is split into you've obviously got the generator you've got the transmitter which is your dno or your local operator which is your power lines you've then got the utility on the end which is your retail side of it now what you're saying is that bit in the middle which is generally controlled in non-deregulated markets in, in regulated markets the likes of colorado um, 
that is something that if you want to supply directly to the end user, you can't. If you want to supply directly to the energy provider and they will pay you a pretty poor rate for that energy, then you can also do that and it's then bundled up in their package. What I think this is going to do, it's going to increase competition in markets where there is already deregulation like Europe, like the UK, like these particular states in California. And what it needs to be, it needs to be a community effort to influence and lobby as well through relationships like EnergyWeb are doing, like bringing together a consortium to all view this through the lens of, this is the future. These companies all want smart grids. They're struggling to understand how to do that. And if you can place their weaknesses with giving them sort of power in areas where they currently don't have it, where they have these deficiencies, where they need to top it up, um, it's all about working together and understanding where to start and like then where to influence to move forward. But I think there'll be more power, at least from this, in the hands of the operators that are building infrastructure like independently than what there currently is. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just had a quick question um, about the proof of authority chain. Sure. Um, so how are like users expected to pay gas costs? Where would they get Ether to pay for the gas costs? Um, right now, users uh, in, in the test network, it's handed out for free, of course. Um, in the full network, we're still figuring out the governance principles and stuff. We're not launching the, the main network. The Genesis flock will be in the beginning of 2019. Um, we're still in an exploratory phase, figuring out exactly the best mechanisms for that. Um, but right now, the idea is you, you purchase it like you'd purchase, it, purchase Ether. OK, thanks. Don't have any more time, but OK, gotcha. Great. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Really thanks, guys. It.